special thanks out there. And I give thanks to all of you. I'll give some special thanks out so it doesn't minimize anyone here. But oh, thank God, Brother James. Is anything that you need to do, and they, whatever I asked them to do, they were able to do it. And, and then Brother James was, we, we had a seminar we had to teach uh, at 11 o'clock and 11 30 in the morning, and Brother James beat me there. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 And he stayed with us all the way through. And it's just good just to have some folk here that you know. Uh, Sometimes you have to deliver a message from the Lord. Uh, you need to have some home folk. See where y'all was at. But I saw y'all everywhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is just such a great God. I'm so glad that I believe there's just divine favor. I think there's some doors that God is getting ready. And I, I pause when I say getting ready because God is not really getting ready, but in the content so that we can understand what we say. God is opening up some doors and getting some ways. There's some things that God is just saying. It's like another God. Hallelujah. But I'm going to challenge you to you this day. You know, Friday morning became such a level of attack against us. I don't know if, if, if any of you know about what happened. I almost didn't make it to Friday. Literally, Friday morning, about 2 30 in the morning. 3 o'clock in the morning, I had such a spiritual sickness attack where I was borderline blacking out. The whole room was spinning. I couldn't see anything. I closed my eyes. It was just catastrophe. I fell out of the bed. wife like, where you at? I'm down here on the floor. I was thinking about where you talking. You've been out here. How long you been down there? <laughs> I told my son, no, you can't do that. You gotta hold this thing together. They might not find you in time. <laughs> so I called on the name of the Lord. And I sit here saying, God, I have no idea what's going on in the midst of this body of mine. This is just an attack. This is whatever this thing is. So I think I went downstairs and just kind of left it a while. About 4 30 in the morning, I heard God begin to speak. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I was saying to him, There is power yeah. in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to deal with this. I don't know go to the ER and go to the emergency room and y'all know I don't like to do that but that subsided and we came to the point she even said okay I'm going to get up go down because something is seriously off yes. and I heard the Lord say back to me that there's power in the name
What was that? Q steak? <laughs> yeah. So Q steak was the only steak that we could have. When you talk about all that other stuff, we never had that growing up. Never had it. But we always had some pork and beans. Right. And some bologna sandwiches right. and some ramen noodles. Right. And we always had a bag of 10 pounds of white potatoes in there. And so you didn't slice up the white potatoes and fry them up. We always had some macaroni and some, some greens. I didn't eat them, but we always had some greens. <laughs> and the special occasions, they always had chicken beans. And I didn't eat them either, but they had them. And my mom, every now and then, she would go in there and she would get her, her little bottle of. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble if I say that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she, she would have this little pot, this little jar sitting on the shelf called pickled pig feet. Oh, yeah. that's not either. <laughs> and so you know what I discovered is that in the midst of a world that I really didn't fit in here, that I was living in a house that I really didn't fit in there, because they ate kind of stuff that I didn't eat. And when my other siblings were growing up, they would have to eat that stuff. And so it messed with my siblings because I was different. Just different. And because I was different, I, I, I stopped trying to fit inside of the box that everybody else was fitting inside of. It's not that anybody is, is, is not better or less than or good. It's just different. Somebody say different. Yeah. Now please let me say this. I'm not talking to you about different in the world that the, the sexual orientation different try to discuss about here. I'm, talk, I'm not talking about different in the sense of rebellion. I'm just talking about different in the sense that God creates sometimes folk different than other folk. All right. All right. Am I all right? All right. All right. Unique. I like different. <laughs> <laughs> Uniquely different. And so by the time I, I started reaching a certain point in age, my grandmother realized that, you know, with this boy, he ain't gonna eat all that stuff. It just doesn't matter because he'll go hungry and eat that stuff. So they started cooking different meals for me. Now my siblings didn't understand that. They were a little upset. But that's because they were eating. I wasn't gonna eat it for a job. So it became a, a thing now, all of a sudden they start saying, well, you know what, uh, they think that you're somebody special or different, or they like you, or they love you, and all. You know, it wasn't that, I was just different. All right. Anybody here just different? Let me see the hands, I didn't know I got a house. Oh, thank God, I'm all right there. Whew, I thought I was only about three of y'all here, I was gonna be in trouble. Different. And so the business growing up, there were some things here that started transpiring. I, I discovered that I heard the voice of God. And so I was six years old, having conversations with a God about stuff that I should not have had information about. And I would hear God telling me about things that will come to pass in their after. And that's a strange thing for a kid. Come on, say different. So I want to talk to different people this morning. I want to talk to people who are so intellectually intelligent, so smart, that everybody else looks to you for answers. I want to talk to people who are not so gifted in intelligence, but they're gifted in another area. I want to talk to maybe some of the older folk who feel like, you know what, my days are gone. Now, I'm going to talk to you out of a story. I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to take you to in the passage here. Out of the book of Ruth. So I think I'm going to talk to you out of the chapters 1 through 4 of the book of Ruth. So that means you have a little story. We'll probably start somewhere in the second chapter. Well, maybe not. We'll go to the first chapter. The first chapter gives us a story about an individual whose name is Ruth. And it says to us, before we get there, that there was a, a, a husband and a wife by the name of Naomi. And Naomi had a husband, and then they had two sons, Malon and Shimon. But something happened in the land of Bethlehem, Judah, called a famine. Have you ever been going through a, a situation where it seemed like there was a famine raised yeah. up in your life? Yeah. Some of you all here today have some famines going on in your lives. There's a famine for this, and there's a famine for that. You don't have what you need to have because things have seemingly become less. And because of the famine, Things got so bad they had to move to another place. Sometimes things will really force you in another direction. I don't know if you know that. And so they moved to another location, but the family was so tough there that they called it caused Naomi to lose her husband. He died. 
Her two sons also died. This is Naomi, you know his name, Naomi. Naomi. Somebody said Naomi. Naomi. And so Naomi is now having some issues because Naomi's name means that she's favored and blessed of God. And so now she's in a famine and she's lost the three things that mean life to her, her husband and her two sons. And she's only left with two daughter-in-laws. And she looks at her daughter-in-laws and says to them, listen, I have no more sons. And so, you know, if there's nothing else that I have that I can offer to you, you might as well go ahead on and marry somebody else. Just go ahead on. And I'm going to go back home. Because I have nothing left to give. And the first daughter, Ophrah, she says, okay, mom, hey, that's good. I'm going to go ahead on this shit. But Ruth takes another attitude. Ruth says, where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. She says, listen, daughter, I want you to go on back because I have nothing left to give. I'm giving up on life. She says, listen, I'm telling you, where you go, I will go. Now, what in the world will cause Ruth to make a decision like that? Ruth is a Moabite. She is a foreigner. She is someone who's on the outside of this thing we call the religious world. Uh-huh. But Ruth picks up understanding from watching Naomi that this girl got something. I'm sorry, not girl. This woman has something I need. Yeah. So she said, I'm going to attach myself to you and I will not leave you. I will be there every step of the way. So Naomi comes on back home and here's part of the ship because I was going to talk to you about Ruth and I think I want to talk to you about Naomi. Go on to the next slide, Joshua. Naomi gets back at the end of the first chapter and her home folks see her coming and they say to her, isn't that Naomi coming, returning? And they call her Naomi. She says, don't call me that anymore because I have gone out full, but I've come back empty for the God that I serve have dealt bitterly with me. Sometimes life will make you feel like God is bitter to you. Sometimes you can go through enough stuff that when you start looking back at where you've been, you won't want to be called who God calls you anymore. She said, I'm bitter. Does anybody know what it means to be bitter? I'm not talking about my definition. I'm talking about my experience. Bitter. Anybody here ever been bitter? Can you be honest? Bitter. God, I wish you, you should have did it this way. You should have done something else for me, but you didn't do anything. And I'm bitter now, God. The truth of the matter is, is that more people are bitter at God than they will admit. Yes. I don't know, maybe bitterness is a part of our experience yeah. down here. But I want you to understand the truth of Naomi is that she was willing to admit it. See, the moment you, you get to the place where you're willing to admit yes. some things, yes. God can help you in that area. Is that alright? Yes. So now we go down to chapter number two. Chapter number two here, we, we step inside of Naomi and she started to mentor. Now Naomi has felt like it's over, it's the end. Nothing else is going. She has nothing else to give. And I'm challenging some of the older women and some of the older men here this morning that you have still something else to give. Yes. Yes. You might say, I have nothing to give. I'm telling you, you got more to give. There is something that God has placed on the inside of you that you have not exhausted the means of God with your life yet. That God has some favor that's working in you, but you got to get to a place where you're willing to allow God to work in you the way God wants to work in you. And I want you to understand that God has allowed you to go through a process of things here that you're going to deal with. And so for, for Naomi and for Ruth, we start out with a famine and then she finds herself hurt. Now you say, how in the world is all this going to tie into favor? Ain't fair. You would just have to walk down through the process. All right, all right. See, because for many of us, we think that, that God's going to just do things here so quickly, so easy. But there is a process. Tell your neighbor, there's a process. There's a process. You got to go through the famine. You got to go through the periods where you have less than what you're accustomed to having. Because for God to give you with the favor, if you have not gone through the lack, you would understand how blessed you really are. 
And God is just allowing you to go through the process of this famine. It's just a season. Nudge your neighbor and tell them, it's just a season. You might not have a whole lot of money right now, but it's just a season. You might feel like you're emotionally bankrupt, but it's just a season. Hallelujah. It's just a season. Now she's at a point where she's hurt. Hurt people generally hurt people. Until you get healed of your hurt, when you hurt, you hurt people. Amen. So you screw out all kinds of things. It's not because you intend to do it. It's not because you even are evil. It's just that you're hurt. Yes. And your hurt, you respond out of hurt. Yes. Uh, I'll move on. I, I oh. make sure. Bitterness is in the process. And so the second chapter, Naomi is coming into her process. She's coming to a process. She's coming to a process. Some of y'all ought to see yourself right now. You're coming into a process. God has been, been processing you for three and a half years. He's been processing you. It's, it's, it's been difficult since 2010. He's processing you. It's been difficult since 2011. He's processing you. It was a challenge in 2012. He's processing you. And you enter 2013, and God's about to make some shift. In 2012, you were hurt. In 2012, you were bitter. In 2012, you were frustrated. But in 2013, something kind of shifted, and you're not as hurt as you used to be. You're not as bitter as you once were. But God, because God is processing you through. Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Anybody know that there's something changing on the inside of it? Now you cannot put your finger on it, you can't identify it totally, but something is changing. You got hurt a little bit more, you was in the hospital a little bit more, you spent a little bit more money than you had, but in the midst of that, you're dealing with it a little bit differently. The man that once had control of your life, that's gone, no longer Naomi is having a conversation with Ruth and her conversation says something to her like this. I want you to go down to the field. And I want you to go and glean in this individual's field. Now, what the scriptures let us know is that Naomi and Ruth were poor. Nudge your neighbor say poor. Ask them if they know what it means to be poor. They had to find their daily bread. Poor. He says, go down to this field because this person, I know him. He's a good individual. I know his household. They'll treat you fine. Go and glean from that field and that field only. Hold on, Naomi. You said you were bitter and you have nothing left. Please understand, even when you think you have nothing left, God has still given you some wisdom. Go down and glean in this field. And stay in that field and don't glean in any other field. And so she goes to get her glean. But while she's gleaning, the Bible says that there was a man who owned the field by the name of Boaz. Boaz saw Ruth gleaning in the field and inquired, who is this woman gleaning in this field? They said to her, this is Ruth. She comes back, the Moabites who came from Bethlehem, Judah with Naomi and they have nothing but they're gleaning in the field. And Boaz says to her, well, actually, Boaz says to his men and to those who work the field, he says, listen, here's what I'm commanding you to do. I want you to, when you go glean in the field, yeah. I want you to make sure you leave some extra. Yeah. Mm. When you go glean in the field, I mean, you go work. And in your working of gleaning the fields and gathering the harvest, I want you to harvest some stuff, but lay it right there so Ruth can pick it up. Yes. 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 I want you to do the manual labor, and then I want you to leave some so that she can come behind you and just pick it up without having to do any work. Now, please understand, Ruth had no knowledge of this conversation. So she goes behind the servants gleaning, and her job becomes easy. 
What am I telling you? In the process of what God is about to do in your life, the things that you once had to work hard for is going to become easy for you because God's going to call somebody else to do the work. They're going to do the chore. You just going to walk in and pick it up. Now, this only occurred because she got a word from Naomi, go glean there. Can I talk to you a little bit further? Anybody got some faith? Let me see the hand if you got some faith. Let me see the hands of those who are struggling with faith. Don't put your hand. <laughs> Can I tell you what God was really doing? God was having a conversation about what he was about to give you to own while you're working to glean in it. See, she was in a field working, but she didn't have to work for it, brother dear. But she was gathering stuff, the leftovers. And God said, I don't want you to just get the leftovers. I want you to own this land. Y'all are walking with me. Say, is that the story? Well, when you go through the book of Ruth, you discover that Ruth later on marries Boaz. And then Boaz owned the field and Ruth became... So the process of it is this, that today you're leaning in the field that you will own tomorrow. Today you're working at a thing that God said later on is going to have your name on it. Today you just go through the process, but on tomorrow you'll stop writing out what the process looks like. It's just got to go through the process. And so go to the next slide, Joshua. Right? Let me jump real fast. I'm going to jump way down in the midst of that. Go down to the bottom. Number four, and I'll come over the rest later on. Number four. Oh, I'm sorry. Give me number three. Don't quit the process. Now, what I did not say is don't quit in the process. Don't quit the process. I want you to hold on to the process. Process out. We ain't gonna deal with that. I told you, neighbor, you ain't gonna quit that. But what I want you to do is, I don't want you to give up on the process. I want you to understand that the process is doing a great job. The process is working some things out in you, for you, and through you. The process is making you become better than you ever could have been. Because when you go through the process and when you get connected with the process, you understand that the process is connecting you to your destiny. So some folk are trying to let go of the process. Well, God, couldn't you do it another way? He could, but you wouldn't get to the next level. You need to be here if he didn't. My God. My God. Yeah. My God. Yeah. See, you had to go through that thing. Wow. Right, let me talk about it in employment position. You had to fall so in love with that job that God bless you. And because you were so in love with that job, you wouldn't dare think of leaving. Because uh -oh. you were in so much love. Uh -oh. uh. Well, uh. Now, I'm getting in trouble, and I won't give names that some of y'all know, and I can talk about this in three different ways here. But there was one person who was so in love with their job, they made below the poverty level. Yeah. But they were in love with their job. They talked to me, Pastor, I love my job. I said to them, listen, you can love your job and get paid well. You too knowledgeable, too skilled, too good to be below the, y'all got to hear me, not poverty level, below the poverty level. And when you got children and making below poverty level, Ain't enough love for me. Yeah. Just me. <laughs> so God created a process because you're in love with something that, 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 that was limited in its. Come on now. You're in love with something that can only bless you on this level. Right. So you gotta understand, you know what? Now, I'm right now, I'm on one level, right? Y'all yeah. see me, right? Uh -huh. But if I stand up here, I'm on another level. All right. You see me a little bit better, don't you? All right. If I stand up here, I'm on another level. Right? Right. Guess what? Every level is a level. Right. It's this question of which level you want to be on. Right. Now, you can stay down here yeah. at poverty level. Can I talk? Uh -huh. Can I expose 
such a good person was. Oh, no, she didn't say nothing. <laughs> and so they were making $14,000 a year a couple of years ago. And have children who are as tall and as husky as my son. But they love their job. Yeah, yeah. But God but stepped God, in the middle. But God, but God. God called, started making the people that she loved get on her nerves. They start mistreating her. <laughs> they start using her. Uh -oh. Instead of calling somebody else to do it, they made sure she always did. Uh -oh. Then they started abusing her. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Then they started delaying her paycheck that was nothing to talk about. Uh -huh. Not for the family that she has. Please understand the contextual environment. So there were times she would say, Pastor, I haven't got paid. Wow. When was payday? Three days ago? Wow. And you still haven't got paid? Wow. And so she's had to start calling them to pay her. Wow. Well, you know what happened, don't you? Her love. <laughs> Started moving and leaving her. And so then she would call and say, Well, Pastor, I'm getting my resume together. I sent it out to 15 people. All right, all right. Pastor, somebody called me. I had an interview. Hallelujah. I had another interview. Pastor, I got. Ah, I got three job opportunities. Yeah. Which one shall I pick? <laughs> Question number one. Which one pays the most? <laughs> Question, number one. Question number one. Is it more than fourteen thousand yeah. dollars? Question number two. Which one pays the most? <laughs> Question number three. Have you asked God about it? Right. Oh, yes. right. Right. Question number four, what does your heart now say? Please understand, don't quit the process. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Now, I can't tell you what I want to tell you because y'all know who I'm talking about and I may put too much of a business out there. But I can rest assured in telling you this. Her income today yes. is nowhere near $14,000. Nowhere near. I wish I could tell you how many doubles it's done. But it's nowhere near. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. Naomi was bitter and felt as if she had nothing left to give. But Naomi knew the process that the young women ought to come through. Yeah. So she tells Ruth, she says, Ruth, I want you to glean in this field and stay in that field and do exactly what I tell you to do. I'm gonna get in trouble. Sometimes children don't do what they need to do because they think they know better than you. And sometimes they have to go down the hard road to learn that sometimes older folks might do a little bit better. Now, when I was going to talk about it, I was going to talk about old folk. I'm going to leave the old folk alone for a moment. I'm going to leave it alone for a moment. But for the Christian, you came to mind. Now, Christian, Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Turn around, you're going to see. Now, Christian will stand up and wave to you like he makes a million dollars. Now, if you have a conversation, 
issue with Christian. With Christian. Now let me say this: Christian does not live in the ghetto, Amen. but he does not live in a million dollar environment. Amen. Yeah, y'all yeah, yeah, here is not yet, not yet. That's right. You know why y'all y'all is not yet, not, not yet? yet? Because every time you have a conversation with that kid, yes. he starts talking to you uh, as if he has signed his football yes. contract already. Yes. He will talk to you about the fact that this, you know, you know, he almost makes his folks feel a little bit bad. <laughs> You know, you got me living over here with this little bathroom and a half, and I got to, this is not the lifestyle I'm designed to live. Because <laughs> Christian believes Amen. that the contract is already offered. Hallelujah. That's what he believes. Hallelujah. The boy messed up his knee, his leg, his thigh, and he still got out there and so said, I got to run. And everybody else is saying, man, take it slow. Mama is nervous. Keep on them crutches. You're going to damage that. And Christian is like, I ain't going to damage it. <laughs> we trying to watch out for that million dollar land. <laughs> but it's the difference of being in the environment and having the environment in you. Right. Now, let me get you to the final point here. Well, let me give you. God has a plan for your life. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to understand that even though you're going through some things, God has a plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have to understand how to walk the plan of God to get the favor of God. Yeah. Because the plan of God includes the favor of God. Hallelujah. And I can switch that around. The favor of God is included in the plan of God. Hallelujah. God has already planned to favor you. God has already planned to bless you. God has already planned to open up doors for you. God has already planned to make a way for you. And when God's plan comes to pass, you will understand that favor ain't fair. Now, I could say it a whole lot of other ways, but I don't want to. Favor ain't fair. Hallelujah. And so here is Naomi having a conversation with Ruth. And Ruth comes in, and then Naomi says to her something strange. She says, listen, I want you to go watch the place where Boaz lays. And after he has eaten and drank, I want you to go lay down at his feet. I want you to uncover his toes. His feet. Uncover his feet, lay down there, and when he has conversation, he will tell you what you need to do. See, ladies, I'm trying to tell you that you can come inside and out. Let me back up. Ruth was a Moabitess. Right. That meant she was a foreigner. Right. Please understand, there were a whole lot of women where she came. Yeah. Yes. There was a whole lot of folk had their eyes on Boaz. Yes. 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 There was a whole lot of folk who had plans. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. But it was God who could take a strength yes. and teach her the culture yes. and tell her how to walk inside of dignity yes. and integrity yes. and, and, and humility and Purity. And she learned the culture and she came and had a conversation and sat down at his feet and uncovered his feet. And he, the Bible says that he jumped and said, Hey, who is this? You gotta understand, he had already checked her out. Y'all know that. Right? He already had some thoughts inside of his mind because that's why he told the people, I want you to leave it here so she can walk in again. God knows how to just start introducing you to when you get ready to go. Hallelujah. You don't have to worry about trying to make something happen. You don't have to worry about whoever else has. You know, when we when we bought this church, when we bought this church, the, the, the church came on the market on Friday. I saw it at 6 o'clock on Friday. I pulled it up 
Uh, I had a friend of mine send me all kinds of emails, and so I, for a year I've been watching my emails, trying to figure out is anything going to come to market. I got down to this particular day, opened up eight emails, looked at all the pictures real quickly, closed them down, and said, okay, nothing's here today. And God said, go look again. Six o'clock, I'm looking through these pictures that were sent to me again, and this church was on in that list. I called my friend. I said, listen, uh, I need to go. We need to view this church immediately. This is something I think God wants us to have. We're interested in it. And so he made some phone calls, got in contact with the rep who was selling it, and she sent a message back to him and said, well, you know what? The next showing will be Monday. <laughs> it's Friday, 6 o'clock. He's called maybe 10, 11 times. The message gets back. She said, I don't show on the weekend. He calls me and says, well, Pastor, they don't show on the weekend. I said, what? That's ridiculous. That's crazy. That makes absolutely no sense. How do you expect to sell a place? If you're not on the busiest day, on the time that are you out of your mind? Tell her, we need to see the building immediately and the first open appointment we want to have, regardless of what we got to do. And that makes no sense. She ain't showing me. <laughs> the nerve! You messing with my schedule. He told the agent what I said to some degree. <laughs> and the agent told him these words that he told me. She said, Well, tell Pastor Blair, I will show on the weekend. Because the weekend is my family. And as far as selling the property, we listed two hours ago, I already have 18 appointments. Wow. I said, well, thank God you don't show the weekend. <laughs> Weekend with your family time. <laughs> so Lady Blair and I got in the vehicle. And it was night, and we drove down on Friday night and back in on Saturday morning and then pulled up in the parking lot and did all that other stuff here. And we had a conversation. I called a couple people aboard and called my friend back. I said, Listen, Mark, bring the contract with you on Monday because after we do the walkthrough, we're going to present the contract and have everything tied up that same day before we leave. So, on Monday morning, I got here at 8.45 and pulled in the parking lot and sat back there as I watched four other cars already in the parking lot. I don't know how many people was in the church already, and I watched a parade of people walk out and another group of people walk in, and I'm calling Mark on the phone, said, Mark, where are you at? He's like, pass I'm around the corner. I had to stop at the office and get the contract first. I got the contract. I'll be there in two minutes. I'm like, man, you know, see all these folk already here. <laughs> and they came out, and it was our turn to come in, and we walked in. How many of your favorite ain't? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's all the favorite ain't. 18 people ahead of us. But favor ain't fair. And we walked in and we looked at it and I said, man, I like that. The church was listed for $400,000. We wrote a contract for $375,000. And I looked back at it and I said, Mark, what you think? He said, well, Pastor, you know what churches are going for, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, somebody's bound to come and undercut you. I said, you're probably right. Scratch 375. Offer them what they want. Change contract, $400,000. Scratched out and presented it to them. And guess what happened? We submitted the contract, gave it to the person, Mr. Uh, Bohouse, and they were out of town. <laughs> I'm like, I called up two days, three days. Did, did, you, did you submit the contract? We submitted, but we haven't heard nothing before. Four days, five days, have you submitted the contract? We submitted, but we ain't heard nothing from Six, seven days, did you submit the contract? We submitted, we ain't heard nothing from him. By now, y'all know what I'm doing. The devil is a lie. Say it in the name of Jesus. I bind it in the name of the Lord. God released this place. It's our time. We heard, Lord. All right, all right. It took them about 10 to 12 days finally respond. 
The 18 contracts, the 18 people had become 35. Wow. <laughs> How many know faith? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I got a call from the agent who then put me in contact with the seller, who called and wanted to have a conversation. And he said the moment he got it, he just knew this was God. Yes. Come on, say favor. Favor. Ain't fair. Ain't fair. God opened up a door. Hallelujah. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I have to continue to deal with the process and I'm going to close. Because it's the process that takes you to the next level. It is the process that teaches you or grooms you to be prepared for the next level. You see, it was the process. If we were not prepared through the process, during the process, the year that we were looking, during the process, the time that we were waiting, during the process, the time that things were changing, we were preparing ourselves. We had started a building, but I had someone talk to me. We were looking at another building. Y'all know that, you know, We were looking at another building. It was a billion dollars. I shot every time I heard. think about the fact that we didn't get that. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. That was one of the best times God ever told me no. <laughs> I thought it was a God thing. I thought it was good. I thought we should get ready. But Lord, have mercy. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he said no to us about <laughs> my soul cries out hallelujah but in the middle of that I had a conversation with the pastor of that church and he said to me he said Dave you ain't done nothing I said what do you mean I've done nothing anybody want to be insulted tell them they did nothing right Who you tell me I've done nothing I just work as I'm putting. I'm working hard, brother James. I'm just sweating, doing everything here, and, and, and casting the vision, and putting things out here, and getting to church, and getting people woke up. And he said, at the back of the church, in a nice conversation, everybody looking at me, and I'm, I'm being beat up. But I'm in the back of the church, getting beat up, and I got a smile. <laughs> and he said, "You ain't done nothing." <laughs> He said, you said you talk, you cast the vision. You said you did this. He said, but when I'm looking at you and I'm talking to you and I see the things that you've done, you've done nothing. So you need to go back and do it correctly. And then he said, see the problem with pastors is they like to give a rebuke, a rebuke but can't take it. Wow. Yes, yeah, that's Lisa, that's what I <laughs> So I swallowed my little pride. And I went back to God. And I started trying to figure out if what he said was true. And I came out of prayer and discovered the man ain't never lied. So we came back in and saw the process. And the process connected us. So much so that when we walked to the closing, we walked with a check for $100,000 in our hand. And the attorneys and everybody there looked at me. How do you see this little black boy from the ghetto reach inside my suit and pull out a check for $100,000 and lay it on the table? It ain't drug money. It ain't gang money. And he scratched his head and he said, now where did y'all get that money from? <laughs> I, you. I said to him, I said, you know, the people of the church believe in gift. Hallelujah. And they knew that we were sowing a seed for something greater. Hallelujah. They understood. He said, I, he, uh, he said, why did I say it's tithes and all that? Now this is the attorney. And he says to me, he said, well, you know, I give, you know, I, 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 I give. Why did you make it 30 dollars? Twenty dollars a week, and that's what I give. And I don't know that we can walk over to our church. He's like, I'll be. I gotta come to your church. Cause I need to see these folks. 
But I'm telling you, favor ain't fair. But here's the kicker. Before the favor that ain't fair hits you, you got to be prepared in the process. Hallelujah. Because see, God's going to bless you with some houses. I believe it. But you got to be able to go in the down payment. God's going to. Well, I just heard God say he can give you a down payment. Too, so. That's for real. For real. God is going to bless you with some open doors. Hallelujah. But you got to put your time into school. Hallelujah. 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 I had to talk about that son of mine that has just got it to you. I see how do I get there? It ain't fair. Folk don't try to figure out right now how do I you every time we have a conversation. Well, how, well your son must be so 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 now. And I know that And I just sit there and smile. And when it get done, all I tell you is, well, you know what? Well, he's already registered uh, and accepted. Uh, and then the call will be going on. Favor and fail. In the midst of being elevated, there's some folk who look at me, well, how are you going to become a district elder? Mm -hmm. I wanted to tell them because I had this. <laughs> Thank you. 